Hello, welcome to week four. So we last week went over a law assignment, which I hope to have graded for you sometime this week. Um, because it's a short week, I can't guarantee that I will have it. Uh, but in all future assignments, when the when I have an assignment, you'll have it back to you before the next assignment is due is always my goal. And I'll let you know if that's not going to happen. <clears throat> So this week, we move on to a little more in depth into recruiting. And your assignment this week is actually a job description assignment. So before we do that, I'm going to go over a little bit of technical things. So first, um, there's this website called ONET Online. So you can see it's O-N-E-T-O-N-L-I-N-E.org. ONETonline.org. And it's this website. Um, it's the occupational um, proficiency website. I don't know. It's really fantastic. Here's what I want you to do. So you see this here. It's find occupations. Then the center one is advanced search. You're going to click on that and it comes up to this thing where here you can see abilities, knowledge, skills. And if you notice, I asked you about KSAs. Those are knowledges required, skills required, and abilities required. So if you're like, I don't really know what that is, you can click on knowledge, hit go, and it gives you a whole list of things people might need to know about to do your job. So you're going to find two job descriptions that are similar. So I'm a professor. I'm going to find an assistant professor job at UW whatever. And I'm going to find an assistant professor job here at MSOE um, or maybe at, you know, another private school somewhere in the area, or maybe it's in California, but the role needs to be similar and one you're familiar with. So I'm not going to choose um, structural engineer because honestly, I don't know what is the same and what isn't the same. So if I'm looking up a um, professor role, theoretically, I've been doing this for five years, I should be able to read through it and get a scheme of what they're looking at. So I look through here and I'm like, all right, education and training, that's defined as the knowledge of principles and methods for curriculum and training design, teaching and instruction for individuals and groups, and the measurement of training effects. That's probably a good knowledge point for professors to have. You can also look at skills and look, they've got all these uh, um, types of skills. So we can look at, let's look at social skills. Oh, go. And you can see coordinating, instructing, negotiation, persuasion, service orientation, and social perceptiveness. Basically what this website is, is they have trolled a thousands of job descriptions, <clears throat> sorry, and pulled out these things for you to look and identify in your job description. So you're going to find your job description and you're going to highlight them. Um, because it's online, I'm going to recommend you copy and paste it into a Word doc and then use the highlighter tool. And you're going to highlight the knowledge in blue and the skills in red and the abilities in yellow or whatever three colors you want. And then you're going to give me a, a graph that says knowledge is blue, skills red, whatever it is that you're doing. Um, so you're going to do that for your two job descriptions, and then you're going to kind of compare and contrast. It's funny how if I use the word creative, we all think of one thing, whatever that is. And then I use the word innovative, we might think of a second thing. So adjective use, how they phrase it, how they put it together, that's going to be kind of where you compare and contrast. Because if it's the same job, they probably should have the same required KSAs. However, how they rate them, how they describe them, how they put them together is going to tell you a lot about the job. So if I say I'm looking for a creative instructor, honestly, in my brain, I'm thinking like somebody that's teaching an art class or a marketing class or something that has a lot of art and spin to it, a creative writing class. If I say innovation, I'm thinking somebody that's working on patents or new processes or engineering even. So the two adjectives, although they seem the same, are going to take you to a different place. So that is your um, discussion for the week, is doing a compare contrast of two job descriptions with their KSAs. I'm asking you to do that as soon as you can this week so I can give you feedback because your assignment is to write a job description. So let's look at this PowerPoint, which I will post for you. Um, it has a lot of stuff in it that I um, 
you know what? I can actually post an old video. So just ignore the part at the end where it talks about your assignment because the assignment's different, but the content, I'll actually give you a video on this from a previous class. So when you write a job description, you want the job identification, which is the title. Um, hold on, I have an example of this. I had my undergrads come up with a job identification job description for being an undergrad student at MSOE. So the job identification is this little chart here as the title, the recommended salary grade. For this one, it's a student, so we didn't do that. For your assignment, don't do that. We're going to do compensation in future weeks. Job family, division, department, job code. I just put a random number in there. Um, maybe not so random if you get the joke. Um, exempt, non-exempt status. That is for a legal requirement. You're going to want to look that up to see if your job is exempt or non-exempt. And uh, basically the clue is the kinds of tasks that they're doing and the level of management experience. Um, most, most of the jobs that I remember reading about um, in this class are exempt, meaning you don't get paid hourly, your salary. Um, it doesn't matter if you work 40 hours or 60 hours, you get the same. Uh, but you're going to want to look up the uh, requirements for exempt, non-exempt status. Uh, pay ranges also change the exempt status. Uh, who do they report to, location, and then the date you created it. So this is the job identification. It's just a quick chart. The job summary is a little paragraph where you sell the job. So um, this is where you put your spin on it, and you use creative over innovative or innovative over creative. And it's really your you know, paragraph to sell the job. And then you break it into responsibilities and duties, or you can do competencies if you're more familiar with that model, which instead of saying here are the specific tasks, maybe your job changes too much, you have competencies, which would be things like integrity. Um, if you look up Lominger, L-O-M-I-N-G-E-R, competencies, they have 72, and you can get a whole idea. It's just buckets of ideas and skills that you need rather than specific tasks. So I did specific tasks here. I have um, activities, knowledge, abilities. Um, required means it's legally required. You have AD, you've thought through ADA and equal opportunity. You don't want adverse impact. You don't want um, it to screen out people if it's not actually required. So you'll notice that preferred ability is the ability to work on a team effectively. I know as a student, you um, may or may not want that to be required, but it's preferred. You don't need it. You just should have it. And then relationships, who do they work for? Do they manage other people? Do they report to somebody? And the working conditions. Again, this is for ADA. So as an example, um, my job description in the past has said I need to be able to carry up to 25 pounds because I might need to move a box of copy paper. It's not required because if I couldn't do that, it wouldn't matter. Same thing, um, I don't. I have here travel from class to class. I don't have walk because if you are wheelchair bound, you could still get from class to class. Um, same thing, students need to communicate. I didn't say speak and write because if there was ADA, there is other ways they could communicate. So you're going to want to use those kinds of words. And that tells people um, accommodations that we might want. So you go back to the job description, and those are the ones that we're talking about. Um, standards of performance, expectations for quality, quantity of work. So if we come back up here, general academic topics, reading and writing, math, mathematics, proficiency level of 22 to 26 overall ACT. That's my standard of performance. Because if I just say proficient, what do I mean? Do I mean eighth grade? Do I mean 12th grade? Do I mean good enough that I don't notice that you have deficits? Well, I put in a standard, 22 to 26. If they can get that on ACT, they're where I need to be. And according to my students, that's evidently really high. <laughs> I was an SAT, SAT student, so the AT, ACT scores, I just chose a couple numbers and like, that's not proficient. That's pretty high. So uh, for those of you that are aware of those numbers, I know it's a little bit higher, so my apologies. Um, but you can see this is the kind of, um, this is a very generic, not necessarily legally correct, being as we built it in class on Friday. Um, as a group, but it, it's on the right track. So this is actually your assignment for the week is to write a job description. So if we click into the assignment to get the details, develop a job description for a position you're familiar with, hopefully that aligns with your job description discussion to kind of get you on the right track. Um, so if you like some things from job description one and some things from job description two, and then you find a couple things on ONET, 
feel free to merge those into your new baby. You do not need to start from scratch. So please include all the legally required components. So are they exempt in that ADA part? The ADA part is what's legal versus preferred and what's the working conditions. That's where we hit ADA. Um, if you don't have those two, you're not legally compliant. So going back to Blackboard, um, the KSAs for the position, you do not need to say the knowledge, the skills, the ability. You can just have them listed out as duties and tasks and however you're, you want it formatted. Um, and then format it as it would appear in an HR posting. So that's the first half. And that's going to be formatted like you would see it in HR, not APA. No references, no nothing. I want it formatted. I understand you're going to sample from here and sample from there. We're going to use the word sample like we're music artists rather than steal. It's fine. We do that all the time in human resources. Just don't copy and paste the whole entire uh, job description from somewhere else because when you submit it on Blackboard, it will fire up as plagiarism. So tweak. All right, part two, based on the job description you created, please create five specific and five objective interview questions total. So you come up with your job description. Then what questions should you ask about that job description for your candidate? Um, total of 10. So specific questions are not going to be um, about the candidate. They're going to be about the job. So let's go to our Let's go to our student one here that we have, because you're all students, so you should be familiar. Um, learning and passing classes and chosen academic discipline is required activity one. Tell me about a class that you have taken in the past that you um, successfully completed and how it went for you and how you were able to be successful in that class. And they're going to give you an example. Um, tell me... Um, give them a, a critical problem to solve. Um, you're on a team of four students and one of them isn't pulling their weight and the professor has said that the class group needs to fix it on their own. How, do, how would you propose to the group that it be fixed or corrected? And just see how they think through it and then you score it. So speaking of scoring, I said objective. <clears throat> Here is what I'm talking about. So I used a competency. Um, business acumen rather than a task. So tell me about a time you've used business acumen in your current job. And for those of you who are like, I don't even know what that means. Um, it is how well you understand how businesses work and operate and the levers that pull that get things done. So they answer the question and you look, okay, candidate did not speak to business acumen, but another skill or competency, I'm going to give them a zero. Candidate showed a very weak example of business acumen or misused it. So students said business acumen when they got lost in a building and knew how to read the wall signs to find the right office. Okay, that was really weak. Um, borderline not correct. I'm going to give them a one. The uh, candidate shows a low level example. Okay, their example here is a student said they used LinkedIn to find the correct person based on connections or current clients, understands political aspects and connectivity. You see what I'm saying here? It needs to be clear cut. So if I am interviewing candidates, I can look and be like, they showed proficiency, they showed mastery, um, and then I gave examples um, so they would know. So if you use just the words proficiency and mastery, you're going to need to reference out somewhere what proficiency and mastery levels mean. So for business acumen, um, their Lominger actually has a whole thing of what proficiency looks like, what mastery looks like, and that was also provided to the interview scorers. So don't use words that don't have definitions in them. Okay, so that's what's going to have. So pretty much this paper, you're going to have a job description, and then you're going to have a list of five questions with um, just five specific questions about the job, and then you're going to have five objective interview questions that have a scoring thing like this. Here, if you want all 10 to have scoring things like this, fantastic. Just know that it makes it less um, subjective. You start removing some of the human factors that just don't fit as well. So we sometimes like having a mix of subjective, which means opinion-based, and objective, which it is what it is. You got a four. Um, they can also be go, no-go questions. So one of your examples for, sorry, I just hit something across my desk, even though the skittering noise. Um, uh, 
high school degree or equivalency from an approved program. Do you have your high school diploma or GED? Yes, no. One point, zero points. Go, no go. It can be like that. Do you have your RN licensure? Do you have your undergrad degree? Whatever it is, it can be a go, no go. Um, that one's pretty easy as well. It's a good um, question. So that's it for our weekly overview. I will be available this week for questions. Your assignment is due Thursday night. So stated versus embodied HR practices. My stated practices, I'm not allowed to ask you to have stuff due once break starts. Break starts Thursday night at midnight. Embodied practice, I'm not grading this until after Easter. So if you have it turned in before Sunday night, I will not start the late policy points until Sunday night at midnight. So stated policy is it's due Thursday night because I'm not allowed to have stuff due over break. Embodied practices, I'm not going to hit the late point penalty trigger until Sunday night's normal deadline. So hopefully that makes sense to you. If it doesn't, you have my email, muscalic at msoe.edu. This weekend, I have a marathon on Saturday, and then I have 13 family members coming over for Easter dinner. So try to reach out to me before the weekend starts. I'm going to be crazy busy. I'm not going to be taking phone calls. I'm going to be loud and crazy. Um, I will take texts, um, but yeah, try, try to do the work before then, at least ask questions before then. Have a good week. Happy Easter for those of you that celebrate. Enjoy your spring break. Take the time, relax, recharge in human resources. We know that you can get burned out. So take the break. As soon as you turn this assignment in, take the week off and I'll see you back Monday the 9th. Bye.